Hello and welcome to Critical Learnings on Forest and Adivasi Rights. This course on Forest Rights Act 2006 is designed to help us understand the rights guaranteed under FRA in light of constitutional law and in relation to other laws. So, in this lecture, we are going to discuss the major principles of constitutional law in detail. It will help us develop an understanding of our diverse and rich democracy. The understanding of these principles are essential for testing the constitutionality of legislative and executive actions. When our constitutional rights are violated by illegal and arbitrary actions of the state and private parties, knowing these constitutional principles will help the right holders defend their rights adequately. Knowledge of such principles is especially important for marginalized peoples as well as lawyers and activists who work with them. In this lecture, we are going to talk about a number of legal principles that are essential to our constitution, such as the rule of law, the separation of powers, the distribution of powers through asymmetrical federalism, due process and substantive equality. These principles have been constructed over a period of time through judicial interpretations of the fundamental rights and the directive principles of the state policy provided in the constitution. Before we start talking about these principles of constitutional law, we need to acknowledge that the preamble of our constitution represents the spirit of our democracy. It lays down four basic principles of the political society in our country, justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. It recognizes India as a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. To understand the spirit of our constitutional values listed in the preamble, we will start our discussion with the rule of law. It is the founding principle of any constitutional democracy. The Supreme Court in its judgment in Keshwa Nanda Bharati versus State of Kerala laid down that while amendments to the constitution are possible, its basic structure cannot be amended. The principle of rule of law and the ideals described in the preamble are part of this basic structure. So what does rule of law mean? It means that in a democratic society, we are governed by the law and not by the whims and fancies of the powerful. Power itself emanates from law and not at the dictate of a ruler. In India, the constitution is the source of all laws, rules and regulations. Their legality and legitimacy are derived from constitutional principles and provisions. For example, if a law violates the right to equality or right to life, then it is a violation of the rule of law. The discourse on death penalty opens up a very interesting discussion on rule of law. Civil liberty groups have been advocating for abolition of death penalty. They argue that death penalty takes away fundamental right to life of a citizen. Also, those who are on a death row mostly come from vulnerable socio-economic backgrounds. The constitutional validity of death penalty has been the subject of contention in court cases. In this regard, it is important to discuss the judicial pronouncement in the case of Bachchan Singh versus State of Punjab, where the constitutional validity of death penalty was challenged. The majority view upheld the constitutional validity of death penalty. But it also said that death penalty should be awarded in the rarest of the rare cases. The court also provided specific guidelines in this regard. But in the minority view of the judgment by Justice P. N. Bhagwati, death penalty was considered violative of the constitution. In his minority view, Justice Bhagwati had stated that death penalty violates fundamental right to equality under Article 14 and right to life under Article 21 and therefore it violates the rule of law. According to him, the legislature had not given any clear guidelines 
for invocation of the death penalty. It was dependent on the discretion of the judges. Even if procedural safeguards were taken, judicial error was bound to happen. Innocents could be wrongly awarded death sentence, leading to violation of their right to life. Now, we will move on to the principle of separation of powers. For a democracy to be effective, every organ of the state should have clearly defined roles. Organs of the state, namely the legislature, the executive and the judiciary should not meddle with the affairs of one another. Encroachment of powers by any of these organs can lead to breakdown of the entire democratic structure. It can lead to a situation where one institution of the state becomes supreme and therefore these checks and balances can fail. Each wing of the government should exercise its powers diligently. At the same time, any one particular wing of the government should not surrender its powers. The judiciary should be able to carry out its functions without interference from the legislature or executive. The constitutional powers of judicial review of the law or decisions taken by the executive should not get compromised. The independence of the judiciary and the powers of the judicial review are part of the basic structure of the constitution which cannot be taken away. But the emergency proclaimed by Indira Gandhi's government in 1975 laid bare the vulnerabilities of the Indian judiciary and its independent exercise of judicial review. The ADM Jabalpur versus Shivkant Shukla is infamously known as the habeas corpus case, which was decided during the emergency. On 23rd December 1971, the president had declared a grave emergency, stating that the security of India was threatened by external aggression. The Maintenance of Internal Security Act 1971 was published to deal with the emergency. After that, a large number of people were detained or arrested. Writ petitions were filed in the high courts challenging detentions made under this law on the basis that it violates right to life and personal liberty of the detainees. The majority view of the Supreme Court's five-judge bench stated that during the emergency, no person could approach any high court under Article 226 of the Constitution to file a writ of habeas corpus. This writ demands the production of an individual who is arrested or detained by the police before a court. During emergency, the judiciary surrendered its powers to favour the arbitrary actions of the executive. In today's time as well, the executive has taken many erratic decisions, such as demonetizing 500 and 1000 rupees notes in the year 2016 and declaring nationwide lockdown during the first wave of COVID-19 in March 2020. Without adequate and prior warning or proper consultation with the stakeholders. When these matters reached the Supreme Court, the union government had argued that these steps were taken in larger public interest. The judiciary should have taken adequate steps to scrutinize the constitutionality and legality of these actions, but it failed to do so in both cases. In fact, the intervention of the Supreme Court on the issue of demonetization led to inaction. The Supreme Court refused to pass any interim orders and at the same time refrained all high courts from entertaining all petitions challenging demonetization. During the COVID-19 crisis, the Supreme Court's intervention came quite late. On 31st March 2020, the additional Solicitor General of India wrongly informed the court that no migrant workers were on the road. Ironically, at that time, Millions had hit the road on their foot, walking hundreds of kilometers back to their home state. Later on, when this huge reverse migration was already in its advanced stages, 
the Supreme Court passed two significant orders. Firstly, it directed the states to implement the One Nation, One Ration scheme. Secondly, it directed the union and the state governments to operationalize a national database for unorganized workers. It's clear from these two examples that the judiciary has been failing to make the executive accountable in contemporary India. If the judiciary is unable to function independently, then one wing of the government will become more and more powerful. It will lead to violation of the separation of powers. This will also lead to violation of the rule of law. We will now discuss the distribution of powers through asymmetrical federalism. If we take a look across the globe, we will find different kinds of democracies, unitary, federal or asymmetrical. In a unitary democracy, the central government is all-powerful because it has powers to administer the territory and legislate for the states. The states hardly have any autonomy. United Kingdom and China are examples of unitary democracies. In a federal structure, the states are quite autonomous. They have the powers to administer and govern themselves and legislate without the interference of the central government. The United States of America is an example of federal democracy. With regard to the Indian democracy, there has been considerable amount of debate on whether India is a federal, quasi-federal or asymmetrical democracy. Indian democracy is based on asymmetrical federalism because it gives special guarantees to various states and regions based on their historical demands. Before we enter into a discussion on asymmetrical federalism in India, we must understand what is meant by it. Asymmetrical federalism implies that various states in the union are treated differently and they have different status. In an asymmetrical democracy, the state or region demands differential status based on their distinct socio-political, history and economic needs. The relation between the union and the state and the regions is not uniform or homogeneous. In fact, some states or regions have greater independence and autonomy than others. The constitution of India itself makes provision for differential treatment of states and regions that need different governance pattern and structure. For instance, Article 371 to Article 371J makes special provision for administration of territories in various states, including Nagaland, Assam, Manipur, Sikkim, Mizoram, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Apart from that, the 5th and 6th schedule of the Constitution of India is an example of asymmetrical federalism in our country. In the 6th schedule area, the autonomous district councils have been given a lot of powers to legislate, administer and self-govern these territories. Similarly, Article 244 and 5th Schedule recognizes the need for a different governance pattern in the scheduled areas. Article 244 says that the administration of the scheduled areas and the scheduled tribes should be done as per the 5th Schedule. 5th Schedule gives special powers to the governor to amend, modify or alter the laws made by the parliament or the state government. The governor can restrict or modify the application of laws in these areas. The governor is given the role of a custodian of the scheduled areas. Also, to encourage local self-governance in the scheduled areas, the Panchayats Extension to Scheduled Areas Act 1996 PESA was enacted. PESA finds its legitimacy in Article 244 and 5th Schedule of the Constitution. PESA gives powers of self-governance of land and community resources to the Gram Sabha in the 5th Schedule areas. Article 244, 5th Schedule and PESA together form the foundation of different governance pattern for scheduled areas where majority of the population is Adivasi. We will now deal with the principle of due process. Due process is different from procedure established by law. Procedure established by law means that the application of a law is valid 
as long as the procedure provided in the legislation is followed. Lack of critical reading of this doctrine can also lead to injustice and unfairness. Since laws can be legitimate but also unjust and unfair at the same time. Violation of due process is not just violation of procedural rights. It is a violation of the core fundamental rights such as the right to life under Article 21, the right to equality under Article 14 and fundamental freedoms under Article 19. The doctrine of due process is nuanced. It questions the morality of law and the ethics of lawmaking. It counters the presumption that law is always made for the good or that it treats everyone equally. It seeks accountability of the state towards its actions. So the actions of the state should be rooted in the constitutionalism and law. Due process gives an opportunity to challenge unjust and arbitrary laws and actions of the government in the court of law. In the case of Manaka Gandhi versus Union of India, the court held that procedures established by law should be just, fair and reasonable. They must pass the test of equality, freedom of speech and movement and right to life with dignity. Due process is interwoven with the principle of procedure established by law which guarantees that the liberty of person is not arbitrarily violated. The decision called into question the procedural due process as well as the intention of the law, which is substantive in character. In this course, we will discover that a lot of times the actions of the executive organ of the state can lead to denial of due process through example of wrongful rejection of claims under FRA. Finally, we will discuss substantive equality. It is a crucial legal principle for ensuring the fundamental rights guaranteed to the marginalized people in a country like India, which is extremely diverse and unequal at the same time. Contrary to the principle of formal equality, the principle of substantive equality recognizes that inequality is rooted in historical discrimination among people who belong to diverse socio-economic backgrounds. Individuals are not abstract entities devoid of any identity. Instead, individuals in a society are identified by social constructs such as class, caste, race, ethnicity, religion, gender and sexuality. Their disadvantages or advantages are determined by their belonging to a particular social group. Since inequality in any society is a social construct, the right to equality will be best effective if it addresses these problems from an intersectional approach. Therefore, the principle of substantive equality requires us to think about law and equality in context. The constitution guarantees us the right to equality which includes equality before law and equal protection of law under article 14. But this right alone cannot guarantee substantive equality. The right to equality under article 14 needs to be read together with other fundamental rights such as the right to fundamental freedoms under article 19 and the right to life with dignity under article 21 of the constitution of india we will deal with the fundamental rights in detail in our next video our constitution makers were aware of the systematic social economic and political marginalization of the vulnerable social groups like the Dalits and Adivasis. Historically marginalized groups like these were given special constitutional status in order to ensure that their right to equality and their right to life are protected. Our constitution acknowledges that to guarantee fundamental rights to the Adivasis, the state needs to set up different governance pattern in scheduled areas, which recognize their distinct relationship with land and forest. The right to equality in the Indian constitution requires the state to travel the extra mile to hold the hands of marginalized communities like the Dalits and Adivasis. So it is important to make special legislation for these communities which can enhance their socio-economic and political status.
also to guarantee substantive equality the state needs to ensure that the principles of rule of law separation of powers asymmetrical federalism and due process are adhered to in this lecture we discussed some of the foundational principles of our constitution through a variety of examples the discussion on these principles will help you build an understanding on the fundamental rights of the adivasis this discussion will also help you discover whether the actions of the state with regard to enforcement of the rights guaranteed under fra has been just and fair it will help you understand the actions of the state through the lens of constitutionality these principles of law are codependent on each other so are the rights guaranteed